Welcome back, geology fans. Around 80% of the surface of the Earth is covered in mud, which is composed primarily of plate-shaped silicate minerals, which we group together with the term phyllosilicates, meaning leaf-shaped silicates. As mud gets buried and or subducted, the mud goes through several metamorphic changes and mineral assemblages, allowing us to more easily identify the pressure and temperature conditions the rock achieved than with those less complex monomineralic non-foliated rocks that were dominated by stable calcite and quartz. Because of the shape of phyllosilicates, even the slightest differential stress will cause these mineral grains to line up perpendicular to the main direction of compressive stress, or parallel to the main direction of shear stress. But once the minerals are lined up and the rock has become foliated, this change in texture is over. Yet we continue recrystallization and chemical changes to form new minerals. The first rock to form thusly is called slate, a tough rock that often forms in sheets with crystal grains too small to see with the naked eye or even hand lens often. Many beginning geologists might confuse slate with its common sedimentary parent rock shale, but slate is much tougher with the grains fusing together, and thus slate doesn't break apart as easily as shale, and slate tends to have more of a ringing sound when you hit it versus mudstone or shale which tends to have a duller thudding sound. As metamorphism proceeds, crystal growth continues as minerals such as chlorite and the micas appear from the muddy components. As the crystal sizes get just into visible range, the duller slate turns into a more reflective rock, whose lined-up phyllosilicates reflect back at a common angle. Though the individual grains are often still too small to see with the naked eye, they're usually visible under hand lens. This rock of tiny phyllosilicate grains is called phyllite, and the small flat grains give the rock a velvety, shiny appearance, often with a wrinkled surface, the wrinkles being called crenulations. Crenulations can occur on various scales, as we can see comparing these smaller crenulations to these larger ones. With further heat and pressure, the mineral crystals of mostly micas grow to become visible to the naked eye. Phyllite turns to schist and grabs your attention in the field for its highly reflective nature and often silvery color given by muscovite micas, though other micas, most commonly biotite, are often involved. Schist will often persist across a wide range of higher temperatures, but with increasing metamorphic grade, we may start to see index minerals such as garnets forming, and then starlight and even silimonite within the schist at highest temperature and pressure grades. Should our rock reach temperatures that exceed the melting point of its more felsic minerals, and remember that felsic minerals are those ones at the bottom of the Bowens reaction series which melt at a lower temperature than the mafic minerals at the top, so these felsic minerals may melt first and separate out from the still solid mafic material. This molten portion can refreeze into mixtures usually made of quartz and feldspars forming light-colored bands we call leucosomes, which literally means light-colored bodies in our banded rock. A foliated metamorphic rock, which has dark and light banding patterns like this, is called gneiss. It takes relatively high temperature and maybe pressure to make a gneiss, but just a bit more melting, with only vestiges of solid minerals and structure remaining, produces an even more extreme metamorphic rock. Just before being lost to hellish melting conditions, the rock can be saved and its refreezing results in a rock called migmatite, from the Greek for mixture, as we see its crystals appearing to mix and blur together, and this rock rightly sits on the boundary, mixing metamorphic and igneous. So the common progression of the fine-grained clastic sedimentary material is to go from sedimentary shale to slate, phyllite, schist, nice, then maybe migmatite. We get even more specific measurements of temperature and pressure from the mineral assemblages contained in these foliated metamorphic rocks, but it goes without saying that this is affected by bulk rock chemistry. 
I'm not going to go through the compositional diagrams in this case, as they require many more than three components, which goes beyond the scope of this series, but you can look up AFM diagrams if you want to learn more. It is enough for us to point out that the lowest metamorphic zone is the chlorite zone, which begins when the mineral chlorite first appears. And we also tend to see the following associated minerals in this zone. Uh, and albite is the name we give the sodium-rich end member of the plagioclase feldspar solid solution. The chlorite zone tends to start in slate, persist to phyllite, and even to schist, which, if the schist is dominated by chlorite, is called a green schist. Schist is the most common rock to be found in all of the following increasing metamorphic zones, so the next zone in increasing metamorphic grade is the biotite zone, making biotite schist, which also contains chlorite persisting from the lower grade along with these other minerals. Basically, it's the same mineral set as the chlorite zone, but biotite has appeared, and this is how these zones are defined, by first appearance of the index mineral such as chlorite and now biotite. And in the field we mark divisions between these zones with lines we call isograds, lines of equal metamorphic grade. The next isograd we cross in increasing metamorphic grade is the garnet zone, and though this discussion is focusing on metamorphosed fine grain sediments, Garnets appear in a lot of different rock compositions once they get to this level of metamorphism, not just the pelites of fine-grained mudstones and shales. Biotite and chlorite persist here along with these accessory minerals. Next up in metamorphic grade, or down in the earth, is the starlight zone, where our crossed mineral starlight joins these minerals. Here, our plagioclase is moving away from the sodium-rich albite end member of the solid solution towards the more calcium content-rich, though there is limited calcium in pure politic muddy shale parent material. In fact, unlike garnet, which can form from a wide range of chemistries, starlight is often formed only in these politic fine-grained clastic sediments. By this point, Chlorite is usually consumed in a reaction with muscovite to make the starlight crystals, so chlorite is finally less likely to be found by the time you get to the starlight zone. Next comes the kyanite zone, as the Al2SiO5 forms appear. Blue-bladed kyanite is usually found with these persisting minerals. In fact, looking at the kyanite and elucite sillimanite PT diagram, we know that as we get to higher grades of metamorphism, our pressure is usually too high for andalusite, so the next zone to appear is the sillimanite zone. All our persistent minerals are still present, starlight, garnet, biotite, muscovite, quartz, and plagioclase, and there can even be some leftover kyanite from its conversion to sillimanite as the reaction oversteps the univariant curve. This covers the metamorphism of fine-grained sediments into foliated metamorphic rocks, but there is one other very common rock type that produces foliated metamorphic rocks, basalt from lava flows. These metabasites, as metamorphosed basalts are generally called, do have the calcium generally absent from the pelites, as basaltic minerals form from this upper portion of the Bowen's reaction series where calcium concentrates. Metabasic rocks most often produce varieties of the amphibole mineral group, and thus these rocks in general are called amphibolites. Besides the calcium content issue, Sediments tend to start with significant water content, both between the grains and bound inside the mineral structures, whereas these mafic igneous rocks start with very little to no water. Often the first changes a cooled lava flow acquires happen near the surface of the earth, and involve hydration of these minerals at low temperature and pressure. The amount of this type of change is dependent on the amount of water that can get into the rock. Dense, hard lava flows and dikes being generally impermeable to water, that is, the water can't get into the rock very well, these tight basaltic rocks usually go down keeping their original minerals without hydration, unless they have been seriously deformed and fractured near the surface. 
basalt flows with significant columnar jointing or loose volcanic tuff usually has a higher permeability and can get altered much more in this way by water. A fortunate or unfortunate, depending how you look at it, uh, difference with the metasediments is that there is a much more restricted chemistry in igneous rocks, so that many fewer minerals tend to form in metabasites. Of the minerals that do form, most involve continuous reactions, spanning large intervals of pressure and temperature, so we don't get as precise indicators of metamorphic environment with the metabasites as we do with the metasediments. The exception is with these hydration reactions at relatively low pressure and temperature, where conditions are more easily determined than even the metasediment pelites. Nonetheless, the original plotting of metamorphic facies by Dr. Escala used metabasites. The general trend is to start changing the composition of amphiboles in the mix. Hydration at low temperature and pressure form a variety of calcium-aluminum silicates such as zeolites, Prenite and pumpolite. With higher pressure but low to medium temperature comes lawsonite, often showing up in what is known as blue schists. Epidote is a hydration product, a, a mineral product taking on water, and is stable over a large range of temperature and pressure until you get to the highest grade temperature where it turns into plagioclase. That is, epidote turns into plagioclase with high temperature but low to medium pressure, because plagioclase can't exist at high pressure. With low pressure, metabasites don't make garnets, but it is possible at the medium to higher grades. Again, metabasites most commonly form amphiboles, and thus are called amphibolites. We usually start with a high iron content amphibole called actinolite, which tends to be green in color, but taking on more magnesium, it becomes the lavender to pink, but more often white to gray colored tremolite amphibole. As these varieties swap cations in continuous reactions to become each other, they persist over a wide range of conditions. But, at the highest temperatures, we see pyroxene finally forming as water is driven off from the amphiboles. But as with the metasediment pelites, plagioclase trends from sodium-rich albite at low temperature to more calcium-rich anorthite with increasing temperature. But at very high pressure, plagioclase is no longer stable and isn't found at all. To round off the foliated rocks, we might see the dolomites turning to talc a plate-shaped mineral that can form in high heat and low pressure, and can be foliated by slight deviatoric stress. Talc can also be formed by ultramafic rocks such as serpentine or dunite at high pressure and temperature. Being made mostly of talc, such rocks are very soft and feel like soap to the touch. This is soapstone. One of the possible ultramafic precursors for this is serpentinite, a foliated metamorphic rock all on its own, made at high temperature and pressure and hydration of mafic minerals. This is most common in seafloor metamorphism. To round this off, or really flatten it out, I want to end with one of my favorite foliated metamorphic rocks, metaconglomerate. We should note that any metamorphic rock whose parent material can be obviously identified can be given its original name with meta before it, a meta granite, a meta basalt, and here we have a meta conglomerate, whose rounded pebbles have been flattened into disks or stretched into rods. If anything can tell us that rocks under the right conditions can actually flow in a ductile manner, a meta conglomerate should do the trick. We will finish up the metamorphic rocks in the next episode, looking at the thermodynamic reasons for the textures we see, and some of the more interesting textural characteristics. Transformations happen here, on Earth Explorations.